So it's uh, it's still mm. feeling to me like Star is Born is the film to beat for the or Oscars. The favorite, or it's Star is Born. Uh, the, 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 yeah, Star is Born seems to have all. Well, the more more people will have seen it. Actors love it. Yeah, you know. Although, uh, and, and, I, and I think the favorite is the favorite uh, for screenplay. For screenplay and actress at uh, this point, probably. Well, because, you know. And, but see, that's going to be difficult with the actress thing because you got those three ladies there. Yeah. And the possibility of, you know, people not being able to figure out who's doing what. Yeah. Those parts are equally weighted yeah, they, in they that are. film. I mean, it looks like Olivia Coleman's the, the scene. Yeah. But she's not. No. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so it's, I mean, so, you know, I don't know. It's, yeah. That's going to be hard. That's going to be hard. Well, it'll, we'll, see what, we'll see what wins the, uh, the ensemble award with, uh, with SAG for sure. Dark Horse, Black Panther. Uh, because sometimes it, it is the, the, the dark the, horse. It's just the number of people. The dark horse. Look at yeah, me. Um, yeah. It's just a, it's just the sheer number of people who actually saw it. Sometimes. Yeah. And, and you know, and if you start just counting number of human beings in the academy who yeah. saw this movie in every different uh, department of the academy, or you know, or, or, or or what do you call the branch of the academy? Yeah. That film will have the highest number uh, of people in every branch of the academy who actually saw it. Yeah. Um, and and sometimes the weight of that is simply the weight of that. Now the academy can be kind of snooty. Yes, by the they time, can. By the time I believe, by the time this airs, the Golden Globes will have happened already. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. So yes. I, I, I'm and, and depending on what happens there, because there is some influence, though the academy would you know deny it, of what happens at the Golden Globes. Because the voting for the academy starts the Monday after the Golden Globes, so the sixth. Was the airing of the Golden Globes? Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, the Academy starts voting that Monday, the seventh, or, or thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, and which means that they will have seen what happened at the Golden Globes. And, and again, we're just talking about people here. You know, it's yeah. not the it's, it's, so it's, you know, it's, and, and and people are influenced by other people and what happens over there and that kind of stuff. And sometimes they're influenced towards something things, and sometimes they're influenced away. Um, so it will be interesting to see how that voting, what happens at the Golden Globes, plays itself out in what the Academy does. Sometimes the Academy will just try to be, you know, um, obstinate and, uh, uh, you know. Well, nominees are announced on uh, January 22nd, which is about a week away from uh, when this show airs. So we'll uh, we will look. There's right behind us is a commercial. Oh, there it is. They're, they're, they, are, they are pimping that thing. Your best song, yeah. Oh, it'll win Best Song. Gaga yeah. will totally win Best Song, and she'll perform it, and people will tune out. I think the ratings are going to improve because people are going to want to see Gaga. Well, you know, it'll be interesting. A lot of people are going to be watching for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. Uh, depending on exactly how the no nominations play out. You, not only Black Panther, but you also got Black Klansmen, If Bill Street Bill Could Street. Talk. Sure. Uh, a number of these, like uh, Roma. Uh, we may even coming we out may, we may even one with a new hashtag, Oscar So Black. <laughs> yeah, Oscar So Black and kind of brown, because there are a lot of brown people, too. Yeah. Like a couple of Koreans and some. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, so, so uh, and, and again, uh, you know, people are people. People are ordinary. Uh, and yep. you have all of these new members of the Academy. Uh, and they're they're gonna have seen these films, and they're gonna be you know they're gonna be voting a lot of different stuff True. this time around, right? They're gonna be voting for the film that they like, but sometimes a brother's just gonna be voting for a brother because you know I'm sorry, it's, it's just a true thing. Yeah. Sometimes a brother is just I'm voting for Spike. What movie? Yeah. I don't know. What what what, what 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 movie is there? You know, uh, w women will vote for women. With, yep. You know, which one? I sure. don't know. Because people are... Or, Catherine Bigelow? Or, I'm or, voting or, for Catherine Bigelow because, yeah, yeah. you know, I want to make a statement. The thing of it is, all the films are good. I, it, I, it, it's not really an unfair thing. All the films are good and perfectly worthy of a vote. I said this repeatedly, and we'll we'll jump into the uh, the, the DVDs and Blu-rays here in a second, but what I what I used to always say to, the, to my class at, at Mount St. Mary's, where you teach now, too, mm -hmm. um, I said, look... People always say, "Well, who cares about the Oscars? You know, it's just a, it's like just a, a popularity contest. It doesn't really say what's best." And I said, "No, that's true. It, it doesn't say what's best because that's really, you know, yeah. art, art is beauty, and that's in the eye of the beholder. And uh, you know, who's to say uh, Da Vinci was better than uh, Michelangelo or mm. Mozart was better than Beethoven mm -hmm. or, or you know, Muhammad Ali was better than George Foreman, which he was. But yeah. but nonetheless, for you know, while. for a while. But but you know, you can you can compare all these things. At the end of the day, your favorite is your favorite, mm -hmm. no matter what anybody else thinks." The Oscars are valid for one reason. They give you a snapshot in time uh, of what the people who comprise the elite professionals in the business value among the contributions of their own. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's mm -hmm. all it tells you. Mm -hmm. It tells you 
people who work on movies, who slave away on movies, who write movies and direct movies and act in movies, and, and whose livelihood this is and who are the best at it, on this given day, on this given year, what did they like? Mm-hmm. And that tells you. And you may or not agree, but that's that's a, that's a useful thing to know. Yeah, yeah. In each one of these branches, these people yeah. are doing the best of the work that we do. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and what that thus means is, uh, if you're going to come into this business, this is your new bar. And the other thing that I always thought was context matters. You can read a film in terms of text and subtext, but the context is interesting, too. Rocky, let's be honest, Rocky was not the best film of 1976. Yeah. Not by a long shot. All the President's Men, Network, there were a lot of better movies in 1976. Yeah. But 1976 was the bicentennial year. Yeah. And, you, and you, in the you, bicentennial year. You put a guy year, in some red, white, and blue shorts and stand them up there with those gloves on. He was the American dream yeah. on the screen. And that's why Rocky won Best Picture. And that's an important thing to acknowledge. It, you don't need Oscar to always agree with your taste. But recognize that it has a meaning. It gives you an insight into what's happening in the culture, and hmm. that, and to me, that's instructive. So, hell yeah! If you know, if, if if women vote for women, if Asians vote for Asians, I I would be shocked if uh, crazy rich Asians didn't just get tons of votes from Asians for, working in the business yeah. for that very reason. I'm I, I'm and I'm that's valid. I, I'm I, I, I'm not in the academy, uh, uh, but I am in Alaska, yeah. and uh, to a certain extent. Um, the shoplifters, crazy rich Asians, some yeah. of these films I voted for because those films represented a culture, uh, not mines, but also not the mainstream yeah. culture. And I simply they were they were all perfectly valid films. So in other words, it's not a matter of oh uh, these films aren't worthy. No, yeah. they're all good. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're, they're all good, and every single one of them is worth a vote. And you know Absolutely. what? I'm throwing down with my Asian folks this week. There we go. That's it. Going to jump in with uh, some classic movies. We have a ton from Kino. Kino has, over the last uh, month and a half, released uh, just a, a gigantic treasure trove of really unbelievable stuff. And, uh, you know, we always enjoy seeing what Kino calls from the uh, the studio libraries. This is all uh, uh, licensed stuff. And um, not all of it, but some of it. Uh, the first one, though, is Kino, uh, from Kino Classics. This is a one of the all-time great doc Things it's not really a, a proper doc, but it comes. They did a 4K restoration on this, released it on Blu-ray and HD, and you're going to be so happy. I'm thrilled because I've had a DVD of this thing forever, and now I don't have to watch it on DVD anymore. The Atomic Cafe. Mm. Uh, the Atomic Cafe was such a great thing in 1982 when it came out. I was in high school, and it was. It, it took all of those training films and those Cold War warning films, Duck and Cover, and all that other stuff. And uh, it it kind of put it all together in this snapshot of atomic paranoia, of mm. early Cold War paranoia. and Brilliantly, it, without a narrator. It's just a brilliant movie. It's really a, a wonderful film. It's a delight to watch. It just blows by. You'll laugh. You'll. It's informative. It's, it's educational and entertaining all at the same time. It's just absolutely wonderful. And we want to really thank Indie Collect, who financed the uh, 4K digital restoration, did a really, really great job. Lots of great extras on here. Um, additional government propaganda films, which they got from the Prelinger archives, and a radio interview with Kevin Rafferty, Jane Loader, and Pierce Rafferty, uh, who, of course, are the, the filmmakers of the film. And uh, it's just really a lot of fun. So uh, very, very well done. We also have, going down through the Kino line, uh, Michael Caine in the Black Windmill, uh, which is a, a kind of an, a forgotten Don Siegel film, yeah. and uh, you know Don Siegel is usually associated with uh, with Clint Eastwood, uh, Dirty Harry, and a lot of other great films that he did with uh, with Clint. But um, this is actually one of his better films, in large part because he is working with a British actor who sort of forces his game and elevates his game. Michael Caine is doing the. Uh, the, the MI6 agent here, and, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's Michael Caine doing a kind of a James Bond thing at a time when uh, Roger Moore was not quite the Bond that everybody wanted, you know, mm. everybody still wanted Connery as 1974. Yeah. So Michael Caine kind of does his, takes his run at it with Don Siegel making it a little guttier and a little grittier, and it's a really, really good film. It's really, really good. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite spy films of the '70s, and and I'm I'm just thrilled that it's it's out because it, it had really fallen between the cracks. Yeah. Uh, also, the Revolt of the Slaves. This is one of those sword and sandal gladiator movies that is just an absolute riot. It's it's like Quo Vadis except sillier. <laughs> 
It really is. It's just these movies were so utterly, completely stupid and silly. And they were all made in Italy with Italian directors. And, and you know, this one is just really one of the dumbest. But here is the reason to see The Revolt of the Slaves. There are two reasons to see Revolt of the Slaves. The first is uh, it stars Rhonda Fleming. Mm -hmm. Rhonda Fleming had a little run as an actress, and then she married Ted Mann of Mann Theater fame Mm -hmm. and uh, figured, "Ah, I'm married to Ted Mann. I don't need to. He produces movies and owns theaters, so I'm done. Yeah. And so that's when her performance ended. So that's really fun to see one of her few kind of silly performances and to know it's Rhonda Fleming. I met Rhonda Fleming because I used to work at Man Theaters and met Ted Mann as well. I drove Ted Mann's car once. <laughs> he had me drive it to the parking lot. It was great. <laughs> Just I, literally, what, what, do you, what do you do when you're, you're like, you're, you're the ticket taker, you're at the door. The owner of the theater chain pulls up, walks in, hands you his keys, says, he'll park it up. Up the street, big old Lincoln Continental. I was like, "Yes, sir, Mister Man, I'd take my orders from you." Uh, I drove that big old boat three blocks up the street, parked it, <laughs> run down the sidewalk back to the theater. You know what I saw? What? Ted Man taking tickets. <laughs> he took my job. He stood uh, there and took tickets while I came back and gave him his keys. That's funny. That means Isn't that the, great. That means that Ted was not willing to lose one not freaking one. penny. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but that was a fun. That's a I fun story. It. I love that's it. a fun story. So anyway, the other reason to see this is because it has Fernando Ray. Well, I'm going to do two of them: Fernando Ray and Serge Gainsbourg in it. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it I, you're, you're going to ask yourself, how does that work? Um, it doesn't really, uh, <laughs> but you know, Serge Gainsbourg in a in a sword and sandal movie, you'll cope, you'll deal with it. You know, one of the all time great songwriters in history, mm, but yeah. really, really funny to to see both of those actors in early performances. Uh, so here's a weird one: uh, Kino has released the same film twice, two different versions, and uh, that's a little bit of a brain teaser until you realize they're different sources. So we're talking about Nothing Sacred by William Wellman, uh, absolutely terrific 1937 film uh, featuring just superb performances with Carol Lombard and Frederick March. I mean, it's a real, it's a great, great film from the 30s, uh, really underrated. Um, we've got two of them here. They have one that's a library release, uh, and Carol Lombard is so great. This is David yeah. O'Selznick production, by the way, from 1937, just before uh, he was actually planning Gone with the Wind at the time. And... Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a bit of a noir uh, about a you know a, a reporter who's uh, looking into you know it's a kind of a n- sort of early nuclear era thing. Mm-hmm. There's a woman who's died of radium poisoning, and a reporter's on the case, and it, you know it's the all the usual bits and twists and turns of intrigue from a that you would get in a Ben Hecht script, terrific script. But um, the this one, the uh, the one that they licensed, uh, is taken from a brand new two K scan. Uh, of the restored fine grain master. Mm. Okay, if you know anything about film archiving, you, you you get that right away. It's a 2K scan of a fine grain master. Now, the fine grain master is not an original. It's it's like a it's a it, it's taken from the the negative, but they're mm. not doing a, a negative. It's mm-hmm. you know. Um, the other one is from the Selznick collection. Is part of the Kino Classics line authorized by the estate of David O. Selznick uh, from the collection of the George Eastman House. And this one was mastered not in 2K, but in HD from an original Technicolor nitrate print Mm. in 35. Mm -hmm. The question is then, which is better? Which looks better? Well, I'm going to tell you, you got to have them both because William Wellman Jr. does an audio commentary on the licensed one that does not exist on the King of Classics one. But... um, I gotta say, the one that comes from the Eastman, from the uh, the uh, the Eastman house with mm-hmm. the nitrate print, looks mm-hmm. better than the two K scan from the Fine Grain Master. Interesting. So get the one for the commentary. Get the other one because it looks better. Um, and that is nothing sacred from uh, 1937. I'm gonna, you know, we'll we'll split this up. I'm gonna let you do some TV here in a second. Uh, let me just go through about five of these here. Uh, the Killing of Sister George is a wonderful Robert Aldrich-directed movie that has a, a sensational performance by, from Susanna York in it. This was made in 1968, right when Susanna York was at her most beautiful. It uh, has two audio commentaries on it, one from uh, film, historian Kat, film historian Kat Ellinger, the other one from uh, David Del Valle and actor Michael Varadi, and uh, also has an interview with the uh, camera operator, Brian West. This is, a, uh, this is one of Robert Aldrich's most... Uh, 
certainly one of his least known films, I think, probably. Um, or at least, well, it's known, but it's not uh, highly respected. But it really ought to be. It's a, it's a really interesting film. And uh, it's all about an actress who's afraid that her character is going to get killed off on this soap opera. But it's uh, what it says about acting and, and uh, television culture, uh, especially at that point in time in 1968 when mm. soap operas were really kind of yeah, exploding yeah. in popularity. Coming so, off the radio and yeah. Yeah, it's a really, really, it's, it's, a, it's a good film. The Killing of Sister George. And then real quickly, uh, Four Times That Night is a Mario Bava film from the Mario Bava collection. I'm not a really big Mario Bava fan, but uh, a lot of Bava fans will appreciate this, especially because it has an audio commentary by Tim Lucas, who wrote the Mario Bava book. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's a Mario Bava erotic movie, this couple. They, you know, they meet and yada yada, fill it in. Uh, the Gingerbread Man by Robert Altman, totally weird movie. This was a John Grisham novel, and nobody should do a John Grisham novel the way that Robert Altman did it because yeah. it just was kind of dull and lackluster. But it, at the same time, uh, was right near kind of the end of Robert Altman's uh, comeback period. He had done the player, the player and, and yeah, right. That, although, so that although he did have that, he had a comeback after his comeback. Kind of, uh, yeah. Gosford Park, Gosford Park. So Same this is the company. Yeah. Uh, so this was, you know, for whatever reason, somebody conned him into doing a, a Grisham novel, and it's a really weird, unusual movie. It has uh, it has an audio commentary from Altman though, and that's the reason that this is recommended because. Mm. Any, anytime Altman talks, you want to listen. Uh, Ray Milland, A Man Alone, with Lee Van Cleef. Uh, you know, th- this is this is one of those westerns that just kind of vanishes because there were so many of them. Uh, film historian Toby Roan of the Roan Group does the audio commentary here and tells you why you really should care about this uh, this otherwise totally uh, kind of sidelined Western from 1955 when there were just so many Westerns, nobody could keep track of them. Um, it was directed by Ray Milland, uh, one of his... Interesting. Right? Yeah, and he's and it's not badly done. Um, it, it really is, you know, it's it's kind of a programmer, but it, 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 has, it, it was sort of like a... I want to say it was an alternative Western before there were alternative Westerns. Ah, before Westerns became film noirs. Yeah, and, and, and it, was, it was, you know, Milan wants to push it a little bit in that darker direction and, and does so. Uh, Ray Milan also shows up in Lisbon along with the beautiful Maureen O'Hara and uh, the always irrepressible Claude Rains, who's always around when you need somebody sly to get, deliver those one-liners. Toby Roan does the audio commentary here as well. It's equally as good. Also directed by Ray Milland. Uh, the following year when he was uh, trying to sort of uh, do something a little bit different from uh, from the Western. And uh, this is a thriller that's not quite that thrilling. Um, you know, smuggling and, and uh, it has a little bit of a Cold War thing, trying to get mm. stuff out of a communist uh, enclave. It, 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 it's not that successful. But again, the Toby Roan commentary, very, very good. And both of them look beautiful. They're both taken from uh, 4K scans and uh, really very nicely restored. Mm. Let's do some TV. Let's do some TV. So the Colombian series, uh, or the series about the Colombian, Pablo Escobar, Narcos. Oh, yeah. That thing. Yeah. I, you, it's funny. I think about... I'm amazed uh, that it, things last as long as it has. It really. It, it's it, it, Dude, I mean, in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when Pablo Escobar was running around doing his thing, and, you know, ultimately inspiring films like uh, Scarface. Uh, you know, I mean, that's that 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 period. I actually remember. So, you know, watching this, this is season three. Um, it's you know, it's it's interesting, but I got to tell you, it was more interesting to actually sort of live it, and uh, and 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 then and see it as it was happening in the actual zeitgeist of the country. Nevertheless, uh, if you are not as old as us or me anyway, uh, uh, you did that one way to sort of figure out what the hell was going on in the eighties. Uh, is to watch Narcos, because a good chunk of what was going on in the politics of the United States of America had to do with this Colombian guy, Pablo Escobar, and what he was doing in Colombia. So interesting. Season uh, three of that. Um, uh, Season six of Elementary, uh, Lucy Liu. uh, Can't believe this is six seasons. Six seasons of this. It has lasted. And and you know what? I was a big fan of the show for a while. Kind of went away from it, came back to it. They found interesting ways to keep it current and sort of interesting. Keep it fresh. To keep it fresh. Keep the the relationship fresh. The the most fascinating, the, the, the best thing about the show is Lucy Liu. Yeah. Uh, she's fan. She and I love the way as Holmes. Yeah, 
you know, they let yeah. her. They, I love the way they just sort of like let her have uh, the show. This is in season six. It's kind of interesting because uh, Holmes is suffering from a sort of post dramatic stress thing from an injury, uh, from an injury, a concussion, and he can't quite do things the way he used to. He can't think as clearly as he used to. And of course, if you're if you're Sherlock Holmes, uh, your sharp mind is the only thing you have. So Lucy has to Lucy uh, Watson has to sort of uh, help him. Uh, so that's interesting. Oh, that's right, Watson. I, Watson, I didn't yes, she's Watson. I meant Watson, Watson. yeah. 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 Um, 45 minutes of special features, uh, neat show. The Outer Limits, uh, The Outer Limits ran in 1964-1965. Um, Outer Limits was a good show that sort of was um, coming in behind uh, Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. Um, and order and sort of taking up some of that space, although it was, more science, it was more science fiction based, it was more, it was much more aliens, aliens, and, 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 and yeah, machines, and, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, interesting. Created by Leslie Stevens, The Outer Limits. Leslie Stevens, who was born in 1924, was the son of Admiral Leslie Stevens. I had no idea. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah, who was a you know, sort no of century, very important era. And, yeah. and Les, Leslie did a lot of great stuff. I got to tell you, The Outer Limits in the 60s, but if you go all the way back to the early 50s, uh, he was knocking out uh, craft theater stuff, uh, four star playhouse stuff. He was knocking out Studio One stuff. Admiral uh, Leslie, Stevens. Admiral, Admiral Stevens. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, an interesting, a, interesting choice. Uh, I have for, for no a idea. Uh, and uh, Outer Limits. Leslie even had a hand, because he didn't die until 1998, so he had a hand in the 1995 Outer Limits reboot wow. series. So, you know, he hung around for a while. Um, Guy Pierce in this interesting series uh, called uh, Jack, Jack Irish. Uh, this is season two of Jack Irish. Interesting mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? I like the Jack Irish stuff. Yeah, former, yeah. former. I mean, you know, you're, you're fairly wrote stuff. He's a, you know, I think a former uh, defense attorney uh, who finds himself sort of criminal lawyer. He finds himself getting involved in all these kind of things yeah. and all this kind of stuff. He has a girlfriend who's a reporter, and he's probably drinks a little too much and this, that, and the other thing. So it's all, you know, it's fairly wrote stuff. But it's Guy Pierce, and Guy Pierce is good. Uh, and the writing is actually quite good too. Bonus features uh, on this include some cast interviews and uh, tweet readings and behind uh, and a behind the scenes featurette. Uh, you want to knock out a couple? Yeah, let me hit uh, hit three from the uh, Kino releases. Uh, these are not licensed titles. These are part of well licensed libraries. These are kind of separate things. But all three of them are really interesting and singular. The first one is a recent film called The Paris Education from 2017 by uh, Jean-Paul Sivarac, French director, and uh, who, with whose work I am not terribly familiar, to be honest. And um, this is uh, really quite a good film, and it makes me sad that more French films aren't coming over here like mm, they used to. Yeah. Um, it, it, quite frankly, it's, just, it's, it's one of those wonderful uh, character studies of young people in this case, a guy who loves movies uh, that just doesn't adhere too much to kind of an overarching narrative uh, structure. It has kind of a new wavy um, uh, fly on the wall thing, you know, mm -hmm. Jules and Jim, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're mm -hmm. just watching these people live their lives and, and you're just along for the ride. Yeah. And, it's an, and it's a really wonderful, interesting ride and it has a real kind of a bohemian uh, vibe to it. And um, as you know, that's my favorite kind of movie. All kinds of really, you know, wonderful discussions of philosophy and just and nobody does them better than the French. No, nothing, not even close. Everybody starts talking about Sartre, and you know, it, it, it's that stuff. It's a little pretentious, but it's really, really lovely. Except the French actually actually do that stuff. It's they not do. A, it's not an American. It's kind of a New York it's kind wonderful of thing here, but it's absolutely wonderful. The French peasants talk about Sartre. It is called A Paris Education, and uh, it's a real discovery. Uh, it's worth checking out from Kino. Uh, we also have Old Ironsides, which is a silent film directed by James Cruz right at the end of the silent era, 1926. Um, has a commentary by Toby Roan, as many of these others do. Uh, and uh, what, a, what a fascinating movie this is. Um, uh, it is... Uh, it, it takes place during the the uh, the Barbary pirate period in uh, right after the you know the United States became a nation and right around just before the turn of the century uh, like late 1700s there's this stuff going on with the Barbary pirates uh, in North Africa and uh, and hijacking American ships and, and all that kind of stuff so the uh, the USS Constitution and uh, and this kid you know this farm kid um, you know who really wants to go and and fight for you know old glory. Um, goes to the rescue, and um, it is uh, it's it's a really really unbelievably ambitious movie. It's just so, the the production value is if you had to do something like this today, mm. these are ships, man. 
uh, this thing would cost $150 million. So it's really quite an accomplishment. It's quite a fascinating, uh, logistically challenging movie. And uh, it's really well worth checking out. Uh, if you love silent films and you want to discover a real good one, Old Ironsides. And then the last one is this totally, we're back to Mario Bava, this totally bizarre Mario Bava movie I had never heard of, Knives of the Avenger. Um, I had no idea that Mario Bava made a Viking movie. <laughs> Seriously, Italian direct, Italian giallo director making a Viking movie? What the hell is going on there? Um, this is a Viking movie. It's that simple. Uh, I don't know why he made it. It's not very good, but, man, it's it's like a train wreck. You can't take your eyes off it. Uh, <laughs> Tim Lucas gives, does another audio commentary here, which is fascinating. Tells you all the hows and whys that this film even exists. And uh, it's, it's just... Uh, it's, it's really a, it's a curiosity. It's a real curiosity from 1966, Knives of the Avenger. Um, such a bizarre movie starring Cameron Mitchell. So weird. Mm. Um, all right, hit some more TV. A little bit more TV. Amy Adams, funny, we were talking about her a little while ago. Uh, Amy Adams, uh, a quintessential movie star, uh, producing this uh, interesting television show, produced um, uh, from uh, the uh, Gillian, uh, what's her name, Gillian Flynn, I think it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who produced Gone, who wrote the novels Gone Girl and Big Little Lies and all that kind of stuff. So, um, this is Sharp Little Objects. It's a very interesting uh, television program about a uh, reporter, big city reporter, who returns to her hometown to investigate the death of two uh, young girls uh, and, and uh, the milieu that she has to reinsert herself into that she very deliberately left some years ago, uh, partly because of her mother, played by the wickedly vicious and still did sexy, by the way, Patricia Clarkson uh -huh. uh, in, 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 in this film. So, you know, um, uh, it's 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 a really really sort of interesting adapt. You know, look some of Fl some of Flynn's uh, stuff I really really like the adaptations of her stuff. Yep. Some some not so much. Uh, Gone Girl, obviously very very good. Yeah, uh, that's the, the that's the only one I'm aware of. Yeah, so you know it's, it's not bad. Picnic at Hang Hanging Rock, a series, from 2018 yeah. adaptation of the 1975 Australian. Film Peter, Peter Weir, directed movie. by Peter, right? Yeah. Uh, same storyline, uh, 1900 Valentine's Day. But drawn Day, out. But drawn out over a period yeah. of time and investigated in, the, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different way, a sort of reimagining is what they like to call sure. it on the box. Um, uh, but nevertheless, same story, 1900 Valentine's Day, Victoria. Uh, uh, these, these, these young women and their governess go missing, and we sort of reevaluate everything that's sort of going on there. Um, uh, sort of really interesting uh, feminist sort of take on yeah. these things because the original novel was written by Joan, oh, I forget what her name was, um, but nevertheless, quite good. Uh, the Dick Cavett Show, man, I love the Dick Cavett Wasn't Show. Wasn't it the best? Best interviewer just the ever. Best. Just, just the best. He's still with us, man. Still with us, does, pops up every now and again, sharp and funny. I mean, from that from that period when you could have guys, intellectuals. Yeah. Although Dick was not always on PBS, occasionally, yeah. yes, but a lot of times Dick was on network television yeah. in the afternoon, opposite Mike Douglas and Merv Griffin yeah. and all of those guys. But I always loved the Dick Cavett Show because he, 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 never, he never dumbed it down, no. either for the audience or the guests. He he was a bright Yaley yep. and he acted like one. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, true. Which is okay with me. Yeah. Here you got all kinds of great people because this is all like late uh, um, uh, 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 Dick Cavett. So you're gonna get some Rob, young Robin Williams and young Bobcat Goldthwait and young Richard Lewis and young Gilbert Gottfried. All you know. So you know Robin's gone, but all those cats are still around. So you got uh, volume one here and a two DVD set that includes Walter Conkright, Tom Brokaw. This is like his news. Uh, 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 the uh, the acclamation of all his news, the, the great newscasters of the 20th century, Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters, Dan Rather, and Mike Wallace, all being interviewed by the great Dick Cavett there. Um, the Crown, you're a big fan. I love The Crown. Queen Queen just doesn't get old. Second. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth second. I believe, I believe we've got a new uh, queen this, this year, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's Victoria. Oh yeah, yeah, Victoria. Victoria, yeah, yeah. Victoria's yeah. going coming up on its third season. And yeah, and they have to bring in a new queen because yeah. she's aged out of the yeah. they aged out yeah. of the old queen. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is this is great. Created by Peter Morgan, uh, uh, follows Queen Elizabeth through the fifties and sixties. It's great. And uh, you know, if you're an Anglophile, and for some odd reason, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I I know exactly why I am watching all that British PBS stuff. Yeah. Growing up in the seventies, yeah. couldn't help it. The Avengers? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, so the the Crown, really great stuff. Uh, what's on here? 
Oh, um, uh, a, a few a few special features of no particular distinction, but it's there. You want to go for some? Yeah, let's do it. So got a couple of novels that were turned into not such great movies, but they come with really good commentaries. Uh, the first one is Washington Square, Henry James' novel that was not done by uh, Merchant Ivory. This was done by Agnieszka Holland. And, uh, you know, I like Agnieszka Holland as a director, but for some reason she just does so much stuff that always kind of falls short. Um uh, Carol Doyle does the screenplay here, and did a, it's a very decent adaptation. It's just a little bit too faithful in many respects. Uh, it's it's kind of like a you know it's sort of a it's like a darker version of Madame Bovary meets Pride and Prejudice mm. in some sense. It's sort of the same kind of a thing. Deals with a lot of the uh, you know the the romantic choices of necessity and class and so forth in uh, in in, uh, in Victorian uh, civil culture. Um, so that's Washington Square. It has a wonderful commentary by Agnieszka Holland, though, and that's what makes it uh, worth watching. But the same thing goes for The Scarlet Letter, mm-hmm. which I hated when I saw it in 1995. I think I had to review this, and I think I wrote for Entertainment Today a really scathing, or for Box Office, one of the two. Yeah. Horrible scathing review. You know, I mean, you know, truly, Gary Oldman and Demi Moore and Robert Duvall. Who puts those three people together in Nathaniel mm-hmm. Hawthorne? Yeah. You think Nathaniel Hawthorne, and your, your first thought is Demi Moore? Come on. The, well, the, the thing that I remember most about it is that she was far, far, far too contemporary. Way too contemporary. Uh, but this was directed by Roland Joffe, whose career was going completely off the rails at the time after he had done, you know, The Killing Fields and The Mission, and he was supposed to be kind of, you know, the next David Lean or whatnot. And then he made Fat Man and Little Boy, and everybody kind of lost their lost yeah. the love. Paul um, Newman movie. So The Scarlet Letter was his attempt to kind of get back in their good graces, and man, it did not work. But his commentary is terrific. And uh, it gets into all kinds of really, really interesting stuff on the making of the film, mistakes that he made, uh, it, missteps. It's really, really, really very informative. Um, a few others from rec- relatively recent decades. You know, I'm going to put here The Ice Harvest. Uh, so the ice harvest is a film I totally forgot existed. This was from this dark, is, dark comedy from the wonderful Harold Ramis. This, this is two thousand five. Yeah, it's part of me is ago. thinking yeah. this was early nineties. Yeah. Is that weird yeah. that this this is that recent and it feels so much older? Um, anyway, uh, really, really dark stuff from Harold Ramis before he passed with a screenplay co-written by Robert Benton. Uh, that's a lot of really, really talented people involved in this. This is a movie really worth revisiting. I think this kind of went under the radar. Uh, for a lot of people, it uh, has terrific performances from Billy Bob Thornton and Randy Quaid in particular. Oliver Platt, always great. Uh, John Cusack, uh, uh, this was right in his sweet spot. He yeah. he just absolutely kills this. And in a way, you could almost call this, uh, I mean, it's a thriller. You know, it's a really solid thriller with with uh, with Billy Bob Thornton and John Cusack is, you know, the, the, the guys in the middle of it. Um, stealing from a mob boss and, you know, it's... And all the stuff that happens afterwards. But you know what? You could call this a Christmas movie. Yeah. If they're, if they're arguing about Die Hard being a Christmas movie, this is a Christmas movie yeah. because it also takes place on Christmas Eve. And, and Harold is in it, too. And Harold plays the darkest guy in the movie. Which I is know. Really, really, I mean, he's so hardcore playing against type. That is not Egon. No. Then we also have Big Trouble. Uh, oh, underrated Barry Sonnenfeld movie. movie. I love it, too. I really do. <laughs> This is such a fun movie. Yeah, but you uh, know, there were issues at the time. I know. Um, Barry Sonnenfeld, when you know, just kind of stepping away from Men in Black for a minute, and it's such a such a funny movie. Um, it really is. Uh, you know, uh, the, just this cast alone is phenomenal. I mean, everybody is in this movie: Stanley Tucci and Omar Epps and Tim Allen and Janine Garofalo and Ben Foster and Tom Sizemore. It's just on and on and on and on. It's it's a huge cast. It's really fun movie. Uh, Zoe Deschanel, one of her early, early performances, yeah, yeah. and she's so deadpan and she's so outrageously funny. She really Patrick Warburton is a, is a, just a hoot. Johnny <laughs> Knoxville shows up. Uh, I mean, it's just it's a really really funny movie. Um, it's really good, and of course, you know, it is. Uh, uh, it it it's. It's just it. It's really fun. I I just can't recommend it enough. It's really fun, and then uh, the interpreter, starring which is about a UN interpreter, uh, played by Nicole Kidman. Yeah, didn't I'll, do would, well at the time. Did not do well. Sean Penn co-stars. Sidney Pollack uh, was kind of on his. He was not well at the time. Mm. Let's just say that this is two thousand five as well. Uh, Sidney Pollack kind of brings the the heavy that he would normally bring to movies like this, but he, you could tell he wasn't completely on his game. Still, her performance is very very good. 
they had a lot of top tier screenwriters working to rewrite this thing. Uh, Charles Randolph wrote it originally, then Scott Frank rewrote him, mm. then Steven Zalian rewrote him, and who, there must have been half a dozen other people who didn't get arbitration credits that probably rewrote mm. somewhere in the middle of that. And you could tell it was kind of a problematic script from the very, very beginning. But she's very good in it, and uh, as a thriller based on, on, a, on a profession that uh, doesn't normally get any attention, it's not bad. I always enjoy things that take place in the in you know the world of political intrigue mm-hmm. around the UN. So there is that. There were a few of those back during the yeah, day. Yeah. Uh, let's finish off TV. Uh, Batman the animated series. Uh, this is a lovely box for one thing. Big old black box. Uh, the complete animated series. It has these little ac- uh, windows uh, with these little sort of like action figures there. Uh, that look, that, you know, Batman, uh, the you know, Harley Quinn, uh, the, the Joker, and, and these little bobblehead sort of uh, figures. And uh, on the back of the box, uh, it illustrates everything that you get with this thing, and you get a whole lot of stuff with this. Um, believe it or not, this animated series uh, started in 19, if I'm not mistaken, 92, and ran till 95. That, this is that long ago. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, 92 to 95, man. Uh, a lot of great voices came through the series too, by the way. Um, so that's one reason to sort of check it out, just uh, just just to hear some really really neat voices uh, that come through the series. Ephraim Zimblist and uh, yeah, Robert, he just neat stuff. Um, this is twelve discs, uh, brand new in depth featurette, legendary storytellers they call it. Two bonus discs, uh, all kinds of uh, just just uh, one hundred and nine. Uh, to be honest with you, but for the Tim Burton Batman, yeah. And the and the uh, uh, Christopher Nolan's first Batman. This is my favorite Batman. Really? Yeah, not counting the 1960s Batman with with with, uh, with Adam West. Yeah. But this stuff is this 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 is my favorite version of Batman. If I had to absolutely choose, Tim Burton's, All right. Chris Nolan's, and this cartoon. Nice, neat stuff. Uh, Instinct uh, season one, uh, a fairly recent series with uh, Alan Cummings. Uh, that's it, actually pretty good. Uh, he's just, just doctor, the sort of CIA operative uh, who's uh, who, who's working with the NYPD uh, to help stop a serial killer. You know, he's one of those kind of guys. Uh, and Alan Cummins plays the hell out of him. He's fun. He looks great. Um, uh, I I love it uh, that he that he plays the guy as Alan Cumming. Uh, so that right. we're not sort of like diddling around with any you know like like love interest or anything like that. Um, and among the, among these series, uh, this is this is one of my favorite. This one includes a gag reel and several deleted scenes. Succession. Oh, uh, the television series. This this Which is I a, keep meaning to watch. Well, you I know, and it's, and it's funny because it has something in common with another one that I have here called Yellowstone. Um, uh, but this one is about a gigantic media com- company uh, and, and, and the power brokers in it, a family. <laughs> Think of the um, Murdochs. Sure. Or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, you got Brian Cox at the top of the family and all sorts of interesting actors sort of working their way down through the family. And the question is, uh, how is the, how are these things going to sort of like all work out? Kieran Culkin and Alan Ruck and, uh, and Jeremy Strong uh, in the film. So, you know, interesting stuff. Uh, this is the first complete season. And uh, all... all all the more makes all the more interesting Yellowstone, uh, which stars Kevin Costner as the, uh, the 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 patriarch of this sort of giant ranching family, biggest ranch in the, this is contemporarily set biggest ranch in the United States and all of the things that are chipping away at his empire. And I'm going to show you the back of this box, Wade, uh, for okay. Yellowstone and the front of the box for Succession. Oh, that is outrageously funny. Is it, they are exactly the same. So funny. Basically, uh, you have Kevin Costner sitting in a big old giant chair with his family standing around him <laughs> for the for the box of Yellowstone, and over here you got Brian Cox sitting in a fancy office with his family around here. It's the same television series. It's so one funny. set in the media company, the other one set in the world of ranch. Crazy. Uh, these things, you know. Look, the last the, the last original idea sometime in 1974. Uh, that's what they tell me anyway. Uh, the sixth and final season of Longmire, which was actually a pretty good show uh, about a sheriff and his deputies uh, near the Standing Bear area. Um, and, uh, you know, all that they have to deal with. Um, I, I love that Lou Diamond Phillips is in this series. Uh, you can't really can't get, really go wrong with him. Um, so, you know, um, uh, the sixth and final season of Long- Longmire, 10 episodes, not a bad series for you there. Not Nothing mu- by, much by special features on that, though. Nathan, for you, the complete series. Um, uh, this was a, it's kind of funny. 
uh, Nathan, entrepreneurial genius, uh, uh, who's 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 working uh, on a bunch of different sort of wacky things. Um, he's he's funny. This guy. Uh, he goes into these companies. He he sort of offers all of his advice about how they can turn their companies into, uh, you know, uh, uh, winning companies. Uh, and you know, it's it's sort of interesting. Audio commentary by Nathan and all his guests, uh, and a few other, a lot of deleted scenes, a lot of stuff on this uh, for this one particular series, Comedy Central series. Nathan, for you. All right, and now we're going to wrap out the rest of these amazing Kino titles. So the the novel No Orchids for Miss Blandish was originally released in 1940. Uh, the, the, the the first movie version of the novel was from 1948. But the the better film version of No Orchids for Miss Blandish is called The Grissom Gang, which is, again, a Robert Aldrich movie. And uh, Robert Aldrich made this in 1971 when you could really, really go to the wall with um, some of this stuff. It is, uh, you know, the idea is an heiress who's kidnapped by a, by a, a crazed gang, uh, you know, this crazy family gang. And um, it, it's it's absolutely sensational. Kim Darby, who had just done the original True Grit with John Wayne, stars, and she of course played Miri on Star Trek. So she had that that innocent girl thing going. You could, if you were going to cast somebody as as some kind of a helpless person kidnapped who has to turn around and develop some grit, boy, <laughs> you you had Kim Darby. She was the one that good you were one. going after, and she is sensational in this. She's so good. She's born for this part. Um, I just shoot, it's a really, we... it's a fun movie. It really is. I, I think it's one of Aldrich's best. Has an interview with uh, star Scott Wilson, who's still around, mm-hmm. and uh, film historians Howard Berger, Steve Mitchell, and Nathaniel Thompson, as well as the trailer. I used um, to shoot Kim Darby's acting class at oh, UCLA. Oh, no she, she had a really great acting class. She's she's, just, like, she's still so good. Acting for the camera, and I shot it for like five years. Uh, the kind of a cult film, Race for the Yankees Zephyr. Uh, this dates to 1981. Feels older for some reason. I thought this was the 1970s for for some odd reason. But uh, this is a an action film about people looking for a plane that has uh you know a missing plane that has like 50 million dollars on it. And uh, so it's it's like Mad 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 World except with a plane and not no comedy. Um, but a good cast, really good cast. Very early performance by Ken Wall. Leslie Ann Warren is lovely. Donald Pleasance and George Pappard. Uh, George Pappard just, yeah. uh, just kills it here. He's really, really good. This is just before A Team, and this is why he probably got A Team. Uh, directed by David Hemmings. Very, very competent. Um, uh, no extras to speak of. Wonderful, wonderful movie. You have to see a Selznick production. From 1939, the same year that he did Gone with the Wind, which was overshadowed by Gone with the Wind because, you know, everyone's paying attention to Gone with the Wind. But that's also the same year that Carol Lombard and James Stewart made Made for Each Other. Mm. So many other movies that year. You know, freaking Gunga Din and Wizard of Oz and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and on and on and on and on. And everybody's paying attention to Mr. Smith for Jimmy Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. But Jimmy Stewart and Carol Lombard were also in Made for Each Other. And it is a fantastic film. It is absolutely delightful. Uh, it's one. They had just tremendous chemistry, and it may be the best thing that Carol Lombard has ever done. Uh, she really is just a the a quintessential movie star. In she this was thing. so beautiful, but people forget oh. how funny she was. She's Absolutely. just one of the funniest comedians. And ever. well, it's a couple of people. They 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 meet each other and they get married the next day. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the 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 hook here. Um, but really, what it's all about is what happens thereafter in in their marriage and how you sort of learn to grow into the marriage. And it's funny and it's touching and it's just wonderful in every conceivable way. Uh, directed by John Cromwell, who was kind of a, a journeyman, workaday director who never really made anything brilliant, but he was always solid, right? Yeah. He always made you know decent stuff. Uh, Jane Russell and Jeff Chandler uh, in Foxfire, which is kind of trashy like everything else that uh, that she was in. Um, this is a 1955 film. Not really that distinguished for any great reason. Uh, lovely Technicolor photography. The only reason I would really recommend seeing this is because it was directed by Joseph Pevney, mm-hmm. who would go on a decade plus later to direct some of the best Star Trek episodes ever. Mm. Um, Pevney, very interesting director from his era, did his better work on television, but it's an interesting film to watch nonetheless. Female on the Beach with Joan Crawford and Jeff Chandler again. A little bit cheesy. This is from the same year. Jeff Chandler uh, making it around pretty uh, pretty ably with all of these uh, actresses. This is once again directed by Joseph Pevney, mm-hmm. a trashy film from the same year, 
worth watching only because of Joe Pavney. Joe, um, Joe hung around for a long time. Joe was Joe, Joe, Joe directed Tons. Trapper John MDs oh, and, 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 and all stuff. paper chases. And all. He was a journeyman. Father yes, he Murphy, was. you name it, he, he, he knocked it out. And this is interesting more for the commentaries on it, which uh, include Cat Ellinger and uh, David Del Valle. Uh, I'm talking with uh, David DeCouteau. And um, this is a slightly more interesting film just because it does have um, Joan Crawford in it, who always kind of brings, I mean, you know, better actress, obviously, than Jane Russell significantly. And even at uh, 1955, which is kind of closing in on, you know, she's still trying to be uh, an ingenue. But uh, there's, a, there's a slightly better story going on in, in this one. And it's very much a noirish thriller, you know, uh, all kind of set around a, a beach house and... It, it it it's got some got some moments to it, but still, you know, Pevney man, he's the guy. Uh, Wild Women, what a bizarre movie this is! I forgot this even existed. So Hugh O'Brien, this is from 1970. This is where westerns were going in 1970. They were just taking a weird turn. So uh, this was they they restored this thing and it's gorgeous looking. But um, Hugh O'Brien is this guy. He's he's like an engineer in the army. It's a western, and he's an army engineer who puts together a bu- takes a bunch of women from prison. This is like a like a twist on the women in prison genre that mm. uh, Jonathan Demme was doing for oh, Foreman yeah, at the time. Yeah, yeah. Takes all these women from prison and uh, brings them along because he's got this assignment, uh, this mission that he's on, and he he needs the women to come along. And it's just it's so weird. It goes into all kinds of places you don't expect it to go. And the the cat, you know, the, Anne Francis is the main actress in the cast. Um, also has Marilyn Maxwell and Mary Windsor. But what a bizarre movie! It's just it looks gorgeous, but it's so weird. Um, whatever happened to Aunt Alice? was when uh, Ruth Gordon was in her uh, her Rosemary's Baby mode of, I'm not going to be a screenwriter anymore. I'm just going to play wacky old women on screen. And man, is she terrific. She's really, really good. Uh, directed by Lee Katzen, who who did a few things around the time. Uh, it, it's, you know, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a weird, creepy movie. And uh, it'll, it'll send a chill up your spine. Um, it basically, the uh, Geraldine Page plays a woman who had received a, a humiliating inheritance from her her husband's passing, and now she has to figure out how she's going to stay alive. And so now she and Ruth Gordon cook up a plot that is pretty nasty. And um, this also um, was produced by Robert Aldrich. Did not direct it, obviously, but boy, what a what a creepy little movie. And then the uh, the last few here, uh, the house that would not die is a mm. John Llewellyn Moxie movie that uh, is okay. It's a it's a really late Barbara Stanwyck performance, uh, nineteen seventy. She was already doing the Big Valley at the time, so she'd really already kind of thrown away her her. I don't want to say thrown away, but she transitioned yeah, from yeah. movies to television, which was actually quite a thing. For, it uh, was a in, thing, and in, in, in very bright. Uh, I, I can promise you, Betty Davis wishes she had done the same thing. Absolutely, absolutely, for sure. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, it's a uh, it's a uh, you know it's it, it kind of a Civil War era thing that um, it combines a horror film with a Civil War film as an excuse to put Barbara Stanwyck uh, in a movie and. It doesn't really work very well, but it's got you know it's okay. Moxie was a, a workman like director. He did some decent work, and Richard Egan is always kind of fun as as you know with that gravel granite face of his. Uh, tell them Willie Boy is here with Robert Redford before he had a craggy old face. Show it to your children, your grandchildren. Tell them that he didn't. He wasn't always an old guy. He once was unbelievably, spectacularly beautiful. Um, again, a modern western, 1969, right in that same period when westerns are taking a kind of an unusual turn. And uh, this is based on the um, one of the, the, the last great manhunts of the uh, the Western era. Um, uh, Pat Healy, actor, filmmaker Pat Healy, and yeah. film historian Jim Healy do the audio commentary here, which is perfectly fine. Uh, not, a, not a brilliant film, but uh, historically useful, and Catherine Ross is spectacularly beautiful in it. And every time I see Catherine Ross in a movie with anybody, whether it's Redford, Paul Newman, Dustin Hoffman, I always remember she didn't marry any of them. Nope. She married Sam. Sam Elliott. He married, married and the mustache. Sa- and Sam may win an Academy Award this year. Yeah, yeah. He could. Yeah, he yeah, could. Yeah, 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 Star yeah, is born. Playing that brother. Playing that brother. So Actually, good. Sam's had a couple of good years because Sam had a, had, a, had a very popular leading role last year where he played that actor in that movie. I can't here's, remember the name. Here's of why it. I think Sam Neill 
or Sam Neill, why Sam Elliott mm. is going to win an Oscar. Here's why I think he's going to win an Oscar. Because in the ad campaign that they are running for Star is Born, which is so smart, where it's all the behind-the-scenes stuff, and everybody's saying, I just love the, I love the way that Bradley kind of gave us room to, to grow and talk and expand. It's all that weepy actors mm -hmm. clinic stuff, right? Which I can see everyone in SAG watching those things and just wiping the tears from their <laughs> eyes. And they they have that line from Sam Elliott where he's just, I'm a dibber, 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 whatever that line is. you diapers, whatever that line is. Yeah. And he's crying. Yeah. He's shedding tears. Oh, he goes vi he goes full Viola Davis. Oh, he go that's it. He goes he full just, Viola. He's been paying attention. He's oh. like, oh. <laughs> that, that's, that's what it what, takes. That's what it takes. I can do that. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and honestly, after seeing that, who isn't sitting at home going, son of a bitch, Sam Elliott has never won an Oscar? Yeah. I'm going to give – I want to I want that as an acceptance speech. Look, Sam should have won an Oscar for uh, The Big Lebowski. Yeah, being that guy, sitting on that bar, just yeah. with all those nuggets of wisdom. I know he was – but you know, easily could have gave him that. All right, finish off those, and then I'll save uh, his last three. From the creators of Shameless, uh, British series, uh, no offense. Uh, the British were wonderful uh, at producing these wonderful sort of detective series that feature women, sort of tough women. Uh, as DIs, uh, detective investigators is what they call them over there. And this is one, season two here. Interesting uh, in season two because uh, she's coming back from bereavement because she lost her husband um, and, uh, and, fa and falls right into a, a fairly uh, complicated uh, um, um, crime war. Um, yeah. uh, it's, 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 it's these two crime families are fighting each other, one of which is led by this black yeah. uh, Jamaican woman who's just as tough and and she's not so it's a very sort of interesting because she has a, a sort of an identification with her she gets mm -hmm. her it's just that you're doing all this criminal stuff but i get you yeah. <laughs> I, I get you and, and and it's interesting to see the way she sort of deals with that in the series uh ernie kovacs the great ernie kovacs was uh, born in 1919 such a 100 year anniversary and that's what this is this is uh ernie kovacs the centennial edition Ernie Kovacs, uh, for people who don't know, who the reason why you like Saturday Night Live is because of Ernie Kovacs. Yeah. The reason why you like 90% of the things on Comedy Central is because of Ernie Kovacs. True. Um, uh, if, so you, no matter how young you are and how much you think you don't know who Ernie Kovacs is, I promise you, you do. He reinvented television comedy, and yeah. he, uh, he was unafraid to do... You know, everyone had an idea of comedy at the time that they thought was, well, this is comedy. And Ernie said, no, let's try some, let's do some really yeah. weird stuff. Let's go way out there and take a chance. And uh, it's true. Uh, uh, pretty much every one of those, anytime I see uh, like a cartoon by Smigel, those, yeah. those, yeah. Uh, those Mr. The, Pete. Mr. Pete, right? Yeah. Sure, that stuff. Uh, there'd be no Conan O'Brien. No, no, no. Conan O'Brien's no. sense of humor is exactly 100% Ernie 100%. That. You, know what, you know what the perfect Ernie Kovacs, uh, uh, the, the perfect bit that is descended from Ernie Kovacs was when Jimmy Fallon and Tracy Morgan did Won't You Pop My Balloon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is exactly what Ernie Kovacs Ernie would have Kovacs, done. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, you got to go onto YouTube or somewhere and find it where, where Jimmy Fallon is basically a street vendor, like a popcorn vendor, wearing the old kind of ragtime yeah. straw hat and everything. And he's singing a song, Won't You Pop My Balloon. And Tracy Morgan walks in wearing this like this powdered wig and this skin tight suit and a balloon <laughs> that is attached to his navel doing a little dance. <laughs> That makes no it sense. Makes no sense at all. No sense, but it's hysterical. Ernie, Ernie Kovacs Ernie, did that. Ernie pioneered that yeah. kind of stuff. So this was fantastic. All kinds of fabulous stuff on here. Uh, episodes from all of his television shows. He had shows on NBC and ABC. Uh, several legendary specials. Bonus material. Uh, bonus material in, uh, featuring all kinds of sketches and specials. Just too much to go through. Yeah, right it's now. Great. great stuff. Great. Uh, you know what? I'll do. Th I'll do a few more and then hit those, and we'll we'll keep going back. Still, still plowing through these amazing Kino titles. El Paso. Uh, it's amazing to me that it took until 1949 for somebody to make a, a make a western called El Paso. It just, it's, yeah. You know, the the title begs for itself. Toby Roan also does a commentary here. Really, really a great commentary. This was uh, recently remastered, 4K scan from the original 35 millimeter, two color negative and positive separations. What that means is this. Uh, they they did they did black and white separate black and white um, color sensitive prints of this as a preservation mm. uh, as a preservation thing 
and that way when they need you, the color doesn't fade what mm -hmm. you do is you recombine it in in the uh, the optical printer and the colors then flow to their respective prints accordingly and you know the next thing is you have now a completely fresh color pristine mm -hmm. new print that's what they did they did a, a separation on this and then restored it. And man, it is absolutely gorgeous to look at. This is one of the most beautiful, beautiful um, 1940s era Technicolor movies I've seen on Blu-ray in a very long time. It's really, really good. Um, the movie itself, eh, it's okay. You know, uh, it's, it takes place after the Civil War. It's, uh, you know, dealing with kind of the, the vestiges of the Civil War for people who are trying to get away from it. The war is over, but it keeps coming back to me. Mm -hmm. The war follows me. Uh, this is about a captain who was in the Confederacy, and uh, you know he's he's now trying to just be an attorney in El Paso, and uh, he has a run-in with you know the usual, uh, the usual figures, corrupt sheriff, and you know a whole bunch of other. Anyway, uh, Sterling Hayden's in it. Gabby Hayes yeah, is in it, like he is in Sterling. every single. Uh, Gabby Hayes was in every Gabby western Hayes. for like twenty-five years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, written by Lewis Foster, directed by Lewis Foster. It's, it's, uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, and then the, um, the last two here, The Appaloosa with Marlon Brando and, uh, John Saxon, also, uh, Angelette Comer, who never did anything ever again, I don't mm. think. Mm. Um, uh, Directed by Sidney Fury, who uh, had his moment in 1966. This is kind of the beginning of Sidney Fury's career. And uh, this is just one of those uh, set in Mexico westerns that really doesn't work apart from Marlon Brando. Uh, but it is worth watching for Marlon Brando. And what I find interesting about this is that the performance here by Brando reminds me very much about what, uh, very much of his performance in uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, mm -hmm. which brings me to. The Bounty. The Bounty, yeah. Uh, the Bounty is out on Blu-ray. I know a lot about this because it originally started as a two-part David Lean film uh, written by Robert Bolt, which was shafted because they built the boat. They built the ship. Yeah. For a scale, scale ship of the Bounty. They built it. David Lean financed it himself with his own money. And then um, in the process of uh, doing this double, this double film, which was announced in the trades and all of that, uh, Dino De Laurentiis pulled the rug out from under them, and mm -hmm. David Lean cursed his name until the end of time. Mm. Uh, Dino really, really shafted them, held on to the scripts, and then had it all kind of mashed up and uh, done as a single film in 1984 with Roger Donaldson directing, who yeah. would go on to do No Way Out, and he had done Smash Palace and all that kind of stuff. Roger, yeah. Roger Donaldson, Australian director. Um, I have to say, Anthony Hopkins is amazing as mm. Captain Bly. He was David Lean's original choice as Bly. Yeah, of course, um, Mel, Mel, very young Mel Gibson. Very young Mel Gibson as uh, Fletcher Christian, which was a part that Lean originally wanted to have go to Christopher Reeve. Ah, interesting. Right? Which he would, uh, uh, well, no. Oh, who, interesting. Who yeah. would have been different, yeah. but interesting. Yeah. And in any case, I do like this film. I, I, I'm a little bit angry that I, it wasn't a two-part David Lean film because it would have been better. Mm. But nonetheless, it is still a really terrific script. And Lawrence whatever Olivier. remains, I've read the original script. So what, is, what, what winds up here of Robert Bolt's is, is truncated, but it is still really good. You can't kill a Robert Bolt script no matter how hard you try. And of all the Mutiny and the Bounty films, got to say... You know, this might be my favorite one. Well, it look, actually but, might be. Yeah, dude, in this movie, young, uh, young Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, they're young, all in Le it. Young, young Liam Neeson. Yeah, Edward Fox. Yep, an older Lawrence Olivier. Lawrence yeah. Olivier. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, so you know, I mean, it's 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 going to be good because it's, yep. it's it's built out of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, rel true. Relatively speaking, and that young Mel Gibson, The Hidden. Uh, series one is yet another set in Northern Wales, yet another British series about a female DI who yep. travels to her hometown to, to deal with some stuff regarding her sisters and this and that. And she goes to work, and uh, a, a young girl, uh, a young girl is killed uh, in a suspicious drowning, and then another young girl goes missing, and she decides that there's something else going on, and she's going to figure out what's going on. Again, another the, the thing that the British do uh, that we really don't do as much here uh, is put it, putting a female character at the center of that sort of. Detective yeah. drama sort of situation. Sure. What we do do here is we'll, uh, we'll 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 let ladies play lawyers. I have season two of the Good Fight, thirteen episodes. Uh, the the seasons sort of picked up where the Good Wife left off, I suppose. And we 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 follow Christine Baranski and the little team of lawyers that she builds in the sort of man's world of legal intrigue, the cases they have to fight, uh, and the things that they have to deal with as women. Uh, in in this world, uh, deleted scenes and all, all kinds of other really neat stuff. The Good Fight. 
And we're going to take it out, uh, I think, on the Twilight Time titles that I was not able to get to last week. I uh, had to catch up on these from last year. These are all limited 3,000 copy releases. You can get them at twilighttimemovies.com or screenarchives.com. Um, really some gems here that I, I just I, – it's, it's amazing how these things just fall between the cracks. Um, if I told you there was a Robin Hood movie that had Peter Cushing as the Sheriff of Nottingham, <laughs> could you imagine? I, I can't, I, I can't right now. I no idea. No. The Sword of Sherwood Forest. Sword of Sherwood Forest um, from 1960. Mm-hmm. Like the long-lost Robin Hood movie that I never, I, I, I'd never even heard of. Written by Alan Hackney, directed by Terrence Fisher, mm-hmm. terrific director. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a Hammer film. Oh, a Hammer Heart. I was, I was yeah. wondering if it was a Hammer. Yeah, yeah it this was, Peter this, Cushing in the 60s, of course. This was a Hammer film adapted from a television series, mm-hmm. The Adventures of Robin Hood, which ran uh, for a number of years in the late 50s. And they turned it into a movie. And it is absolutely terrific. Uh, Oliver Reed even shows up in a tiny little part. But it really is. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I had absolutely no idea that this uh, this even existed. I was aware of the TV series, mm. but I had no idea that they they went and did a, did a feature film of it. And Hammer was always doing weird innovative things but that's that's it's really worth checking out yeah. isolated score on that um a charming little movie that came out of nowhere they released this uh, just the end of last year as a holiday kind of a little holiday one-off from 1973 movie called sunshine uh the this is uh, a red wind signature release from twilight time and uh this is kind of you know they go they go bobbing for apples every once in a while and they come up with a nugget of gold mm. and and this really is one this was a. Uh, it, I remember it, this movie. It's a TV this was, movie. It was a TV movie from 1973, uh, aired on CBS, and it is really, really uh, incredibly touching and heartwarming. It's kind of like love story for oh, television yeah. in a way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, except you know this in in this case it's about a woman who has you know the happy family and now she's got months to live and a newborn baby and it just Cliff it, the young Meg Foster. Oh, let me tell you, if the story alone and the and Joseph Sargent, the 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 lion of television directing this, if Joseph Sargent's direction and this cast doesn't pull a tear out of you you know what will a bunch of john denver songs yeah yeah sunshine oh my gosh oh my. that's that song that's what it's from that's what it's from yeah incredible uh true story of jesse james directed by the great nicholas ray who of course did rebel with the uh, rebel with the cause uh he directed this in 1957 and uh, there are a lot of jesse james and frank james and james yeah. and younger and i mean that story's been done to death a million different ways, and they're all really enjoyable. Uh, you know, uh, Robert Wagner plays Jesse James. Jeffrey Hunter plays Frank James because oh. Jeffrey Hunter could also di- uh, had also played Jesus mm-hmm, for Nicholas mm-hmm, Ray. Mm-hmm. So you know, get to play Frank James and Jesus. Thank you, Nicholas Ray. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, it's that story. It's done really well and very competently. Uh, Agnes Moorhead plays their mother, like she plays yeah, on yeah. Don't Be Witched. It's fantastic. <gasps> That's a good one. And then the last two here, uh, kind of little curiosities you probably never even knew existed. One is called X, Y, and Z, Z E E, uh, with Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Caine, and Susanna York. All I had to hear was Susanna York. All I, I had to hear was uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, <laughs> both of those. Either uh, one, you're, you're good. I love Susanna York from this period. 1972, uh, and it's just a great cast. All of them really, really terrific. Um, it, it, great dialogue in this. Uh, this film kind of never really caught fire, I guess. But it's a, you know, it's it's a it's a great comedy of manners with some really just biting dialogue. That sort and, of swing in London thing. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it's really it's it's fun, and those three actors are terrific. And then lastly, the adventures of Haji Baba. I never heard of this movie. No. I had never heard of this movie in my life. I'm stunned that I've never heard of it because it's the kind of movie that I, I would have loved uh, had I known about it when I was younger. I'm surprised it didn't show up on TV. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not really familiar with it. anybody in this movie apart from the star of the movie, John Derrick. Oh, John Bose. John Derrick, Bose. my yeah. father's student. Yeah. yeah, he was an actor before he became a mediocre director. 1954. Uh, yeah. Oh, real young yeah. John Derrick. Young John Derrick. This is this is this is. My father was uh, taught John Derrick. I want to say probably, maybe just before this, late forties. Mm. I want to say it was the late forties. Uh, and then th- he did this in 1954, which got him two years later the role of Joshua in the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you know he looked he looked good with the body. Yeah. He looked good. You know, there's a matinee idol. They're trying to turn him into into a thing. 
Um, anyway, John Derrick, not a very good actor. No, say that. my father was came a mediocre director. My father was unable to impress that on him, <laughs> I guess. Um, but uh, anyway, great music from Dmitry Tiomkin here, uh, and I, you know, I, there's a funny there's a funny quote on here uh, from Gerard Legrand. I don't know who that is. Mm. Writing for uh, Présence du Cinéma, some pretentious French publication, who calls this one of the 50 best films in the history of cinema. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> what what are you what 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 French rot gut are you drinking? Um, no, it's a swashbuckler. Uh, it's it's the kind of thing that uh, you know would have been an Errol Flynn movie uh, 15 years earlier. That would have been a, a, a Fairbanks movie, mm-hmm. you know, Douglas Fairbanks movie, maybe 40 years earlier. But uh, as it is, you know, it's a curiosity item. Uh, and uh, it's entertaining to me only because John Derrick is in it, and I rem- I will never forget those watching the Ten Commandments as a kid with my father. Every time John Derrick comes on, my father would just hang his head like that was failure on screen. <laughs> that was his well, failure. His failure was married to Ursula Andress, <laughs> and Linda and Evans, and, Bo, and Derrick. Bo Derrick. Yeah. So if you're gonna fail, that's yeah, the way that's you want to do. Fail. It. That's one way to do it. All right, that uh, that does it for this week. Mm. Uh, next week, uh, our Oscar nomination. We are going to do this show before the Oscar nominations mm-hmm. come out. So uh, it will be two weeks from now that we will be talking about Oscar nominations. But uh, get your ballots ready. We're going to have a fun time. It's going to be a good Oscar year. And with that, Tim, do we have any, anything else to say to the folks? I think that we're all good.